Hi there, thanks for tuning in to another episode on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm still not Ian McCollum, he's gone off in search of another gun. Hark! I think I hear him now. So thanks for tuning in. Uh, I am, of course, joined by Nick Moran, uh, the chieftain here today. And of course, we are joined by Yuri, the T-62. So uh, why is it? Why don't you just tell us, uh, how did we manage to come out It turns out, out that either carrots or bribery work. So you, you recall last time we did the M4, we had a lot of Sherman. Fun. It was great. We went through every gun on the Sherman. And hopefully you guys enjoyed it as well. We, we basically said, look, it's a marketing ploy. We think that enough of you would join World of Tanks game and keep playing it that the marketing people would say this was worth the money. And we said that if it did come out that way, we would do it again. And it did. Guess what? And we are. So we're going to try to keep this trend going. So again, this is a marketing ploy. There's a link at the bottom that uh, Ian is going to provide you with. And if you use it and you start playing World of Tanks and you keep playing it, the marketing people will go, this is brilliant. We should work with <laughs> Ian more. And we find more tanks. So right? yes, that's my cunning plan. So that's the, that's the pitch. Uh, where are we? Uh, we are today out with Battlefield Vegas, uh, who has this really fantastic example of a T-62, because there are a grand total of how many running T-62s in the US? In private hands. In private hands, I think this is like one. That one. And firing. And firing, one. That one, and... Uh, and anything bigger than 105 millimeters? Whoop. Well, it's 115, so right. one. Yeah. I'm just trying to keep the trend going here. One, <laughs> one, one. <laughs> uh, the biggest privately owned, fully functional firing tank in the US. And also a really interesting piece of armor history as well as, well, it's covered in interesting Russian machine guns as well. So it is. the plan is we are going to walk around the T-62, climb up on it, and show you guys all three of the weapon systems that are built into this tank. So uh, we have, starting from the smallest, we have a coaxial PKT tank machine gun, which is kind of neat. We then have, sitting up on top where you can see it, a DSHK-M, uh, Dushuka, uh, M, I guess. <laughs> Uh, anti it's called it a dishka. I, I, I yeah. butcher foreign languages. Yeah, yeah I'm not going to try Russian. Um, and then, of course, we have the 115 millimeter smoothbore main gun. So we'll talk about why that's a particularly relevant and interesting gun uh, in a few minutes. But uh, let's start off with the tank. The tank. Tell me. You're the tank guy. What's what's the uh, deal so with well, the 62? Well, you're looking at it's basically the ultimate variant of a T5455. Okay. So if you look at the development process and you go back to let's say Object 140, Object 165, Object 166, you'll see what you start off with is basically a T55 has been somewhat elongated. Now the original plan was to put a 100 millimeter, a new 100 millimeter rifle into it, the D54 TS, as I recall. Okay. But it's a very big gun and they had to make a bigger turret to fit this gun into. So what they had to do is they had to elongate the T-55 chassis a little bit. They had to make a wider turret and well, you can see the, the flange which overhangs the edge of the hull. That's purely for the turret ring because they couldn't make the tank wider, it wouldn't fit on the railway anymore. That's an issue, logistics. I mean, people will always talk down on the T-62 or T-72 the Russians are not idiots. When they design something, there is a good rational reason behind it. So anyway, you got this massive big turret and you have the original T-62. So you look at the engine deck, it looks like a, a T-5455 engine deck. Then it changed it. The big obvious giveaway is obviously going to be the gun and the wheel arrangement. And they're basically T-5455 wheels as well. They just spaced them a little bit differently okay. because the weight balance of the tank has been changed by mm. the addition of the big gun, which now has more weight up front and the big turret. Okay. But uh, it came out in 62. This particular one is a Model 72 uh, because of the Dishkin, or however you pronounce it. No, no offense to any Russians watching this. I'm, I'm Irish. I bet you're Irish enough. 
and um, then of course he came in with the 115 which we'll talk about a little bit uh, okay. in a minute would it be fair to say that this is like the last of the world war ii style tanks yes this the, is the last of the simple Soviet. In fact, part of the reason it entered into such large scale production was they couldn't quite get the T-64 sorted out. Okay. Which was the complicated one with the autoloader. It's like the, 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 the new first line tank that was going to be better than anything NATO had. Okay. But it is a, you were quite correct. This is one of the last of the simple tanks. Right. Well, I mean, here, let, let's walk over. Here's an example of how brutally simple the early T-62 was. Yeah. What's holding the track together? Okay, let's have a look at the back right here. But you will note how it's scraped. It and, and this is a system that goes way back to pre-World War II. Uh, later T-62 tracks, so this was the OHKM track, there was the RSHKM track, which actually has proper bolts on Let's move on to the PKT before you start telling us about the tensioning system. <laughs> <laughs> but it's over there, it's so interesting. <laughs> All right, so. First and smallest little gun that we have on this tank is a PKT as a coaxial gun. Right. So even to this day, we still have coaxial machine guns on tanks, right? Yep. You, um, you have to. It's the most commonly used weapon. Is it really? Well, because you think of what most of your targets are going to be. You're going to be shooting. There are more troops on the battlefield than there are tanks. There are more trucks on the battlefield than there are tanks. Okay. So if you don't have a good coaxial machine gun, your tank is really, really hobbled. Okay. I suppose most targets don't justify a gigantic HE or no, anti-tank. Yeah, on, on, on this tank, you're only carrying 40 rounds of 115 versus 2750 or whatever it is on, on the coax. Okay. So you, why use the big round if you don't have to? Okay. So, uh, yeah, what? There, there was going to be a second one at the front. They decided, uh, no, that was a stupid idea, like the old D-54. You know, oh, let's redesignate the tank as a tank destroyer. We can get away without it being a, a bow gun, machine gun. <laughs> So okay, that's an interesting course, reason. To, I, we've pretty much gotten away from bow machine guns about this period, like in all tanks, haven't we? Uh, Sixty. I can't think of anything that was still being coming off the production line with them. Uh, it, oddly, so the, the Israelis came up with uh, their modifications of the Sherman, and unlike the British Firefly, they got they kept the bow machine gunner instead of using the room for ammunition. Hmm. But after the 1970s, they realized, well, hang on a second. If you take the bow gunner from four tanks. You can man a fifth tank. What is more important to you, a fifth tank or four extra machine guns? Okay. And I, I think that's a fairly good argument. And Makes sense, yeah. You, know, you get more room for your ammunition. So underneath here, it's your, you got ammo storage for the 115 instead okay. of you know, where the driver is on the other side. All right. Um, so in this particular vehicle, that is a PKT, a Kalashnikov Design Bureau uh, machine gun. And I believe the T-62 was actually the first production vehicle to get the PKT. Sounds right, I'm not going to argue it. Uh, prior to this, it would have been the SG-43 Goryanov. And of course, with both the Goryanov and the Kalashnikov, they made a tank version. Because you've already got this really good general purpose machine gun for the infantry. Let's use the same mechanism, why not, but make a few tweaks to fit it into a tank. So you don't need a pistol grip on it. What they did instead was outfit it with an electrical solenoid trigger. So the gunner down in here, and we'll take a look at that in a moment, he's actually got a little joystick control with a fire button on it for the machine gun. Burp. That is pretty cool. Um, take the buttstock off. You don't need that. Yeah. Uh, give it a heavier barrel because you're not going to be changing the barrels out on these things. Um, get a little more sustained fire, and it doesn't matter what the weight is really because the tank the can handle it. it. Yeah. Yeah. The tank's like already it. handling 3,000 rounds of ammunition. It can handle a kilo or two extra barrel weight. Why carry a weapon when the weapon will carry you? Yes. So uh, another interesting question with coax is just how accurate do you want the coax to be? So you can you have two screws at all. One is you have to absolutely pinpoint accurate, which means that you have to manually create the beating zone. Or the other is you deliberately leave it a little bit loose with a little bit of vibration, so you get a little bit of dispersion. I can see pros and cons both ways. And that's why tanks were built both ways. <laughs> <laughs> um, the one other thing they did on the PK uh, for the PKT, the tank version, is they actually changed up the gas block design slightly to reduce the amount of gas that it was ejected into the vehicle. Um, the, you know, on an infantry gun, it doesn't really matter if, if some of your gas is vented out the gas block. Well, the gas block on this is sitting inside a tight tank, and you don't really want to overwhelm that with machine gun fumes if you can avoid it. Or anything else. So the, the story of fumes is actually, we'll come back to the story of fumes on this tank when we get to the 115. Well, let's go inside and take a look at the uh, the business end or the the operator's end right. of that PKT. We'll do that. So, 
All right, so down here inside, uh, this would be the loader's hatch. We have our PKT right in front of us. A couple things to point out. We have a charging handle on a chain here to connect up to there. We have our solenoid firing mechanism, which is going to be connected down. It is currently disconnected to safe the gun. Uh, but everything else that you need to do on the gun, you can do right here. You can pop the top cover. You can do that one hand. Here we go. That allows you to load the gun up. You have a bracket for a can of ammunition there. Big manual trigger down here. All right, so um, if we are in here to fire either the main gun or the coax, we would normally have, ah, yes, we'll have Nick move into the gunner's seat instead of the commander's seat. Commander is very friendly behind the gunner. It's actually not too bad. No, it kind of isn't. So you've got your hands on the turret controls, mm -hmm. um, which if this were powered on would be moving the turret around. And then the light right there in front of you would normally be where the gunner's direct fire optic is, yes? Yeah. And would that be one single optic for both the coax and the main gun? Yes. Okay, keep, keep it simple. Okay. And uh, what's kind of cool there is because, uh, well, they didn't have to recalibrate the coax reticle uh, or elements of the reticle because they kept the exact same barrel length between the Goryanov tank guns and the PK tank guns. So there's that, which is nice. But uh, we don't have this in place, so kind of our next best thing for firing the coax is going to be the vision block uh, right up there. Uh, and then there's also another big bracket right in front of you. Yeah, what was that right. one? So if you remember, the, the night vision systems that the Soviets had were not necessarily considered to be the greatest possible. Uh, so unlike an integrated system that we would have today, there would, you would often find a separate site for the infrared to the main gun. So you saw on the front there are infrared, active infrared searchlights, basically. Right. So the idea is you spot, you, it's a big spotlight, and the reason it's infrared is so that people with the naked eye can't see what the problem is. Everybody on the other side also has infrared receivers, <laughs> so you're not really much better off. Right. And the act, the effective range of these early infrareds is only in a matter of you know six, seven hundred meters anyway. You could use it passively, maybe a couple of hundred meters, but you would have a separate site here just for the night vision. Okay, so let's load this up. I am going to move over to the gunner's seat and we're gonna have one of the Battlefield Vegas guys uh, come over to maintain the gun and we'll do a little bit of PKT shooting. It did not take very long to do 50 rounds. Nope. Solenoids off. All right, Nick. Uh, now, moving up onto the turret, we have the number two gun, which actually wasn't always here on the T-62, was it? Nope. Or on the T-54-55 after the post-war era either. So the problem was, this is, this is an anti-aircraft gun is what it really used for. If you have troops, that's why you got the PKT. This is exactly the same as on the Sherman. Yeah, basically, the, it's caliber 50. The 50 yeah. on the top of the turret is for shooting at aircraft. Uh, but the problem was that the Russians figured that, well, what are the aircraft that we're shooting at? And you're, you're shooting at the early jets, your, your F-84s, F-86s, oh. whatever. And you couldn't really hit anything. It was a complete waste of time. So T-62 for 10 years was built without a machine gun mount. And a lot of the T-54s were as well. Then the Americans come up with this thing called the attack helicopter, which flies a lot slower than a jet and you can actually shoot one down with a machine gun. That, that I might be able to so they there. decided, well, let's, uh, let's put these machine guns back on the tanks. So it was much easier to put the machine gun on the T-55 turret than it was the T-62. They had to completely redesign the shape of the casting hmm. to get the, uh, the, the gun on. So the model 1972 is the one that introduced this new turret shape with the mount for the dish gun. So you know this is one of the last of the 19,000 or so T-62s made. Okay. So, as far as the gun itself, it is basically a standard DSHKM. The M is the modernized version, uh, which dates to 1946 when it was adopted. I think production actually began in early 1945. And essentially what they did is completely replace the feed system. Because the Soviets were looking at ways to mount these in multiple 
uh, multi-gun mountings, and the original DSHK feed system, which is, by the way, the SH in that DSHK, um, the original feed system couldn't be adapted to be left or right-hand feed. So they replace it with this guy, which is easily convertible between left and right. Um, that becomes largely the M. Probably the easiest way to recognize the M is by that muzzle brake, um, which is a good bit chunkier than the original Dishka muzzle brakes. Sure, I guess. Um, there would have originally been an anti-aircraft sight for this, which we don't have on it at the moment. Uh, but we have a really cool traverse and elevation system. I have an elevation hand wheel here, and you can hopefully see the spring in here. There are two springs that hold the gun at whatever position, so it's really quite easy for me to elevate this, despite the fact that this is a solid 100-pound gun. Um, I have a little handle here, so if I clamp down on the handle, it locks the elevation, and then I can also traverse the entire cupola. Let me see if I can do this without knocking you off the tank. Yeah. I guess it's worth noting also, this is the loader's heavy machine gun. So that's a lot of true. people see the, the big 50 cal on, let's say, an Abrams uh, is on the right-hand side, because that's what the TC is. But on this tank, you're on the loader side. And this emphasizes why it's an anti-aircraft gun, because if you're if you're shooting an aircraft, you don't need to be running the 115 or the coax. That's right. It's the other cupola over there that is the commander's position, isn't it? Okay. So we have ammo storage right here. This would be normally would hold 100 rounds of... Uh, this is 50, uh, 0.50 or 12.7 by 108 millimeter. Uh, the Russian DSHK cartridge is a little bit bigger than the US 50 Browning. So lock that up because it's not in use. That, of course, that belt will feed right into the gun. Now to actually release the, the pintle to move, we have a lockout lever right here. Flip that up and then I can elevate and depress with my hand wheel here. Uh, we have a lockout for the cupola that's actually up inside here, but works very similarly. Um, to rotate just the mount, you've got that one right there. Now, as originally designed, this would be your firing trigger. So you would use this hand to control the lateral movement of the gun, and you would use your right hand to control the elevation and the elevation lock if you need it. This particular turret hasn't been set up to actually uh, fire remotely, so instead of having the solenoid attachment on the back, this tank has been set up with a regular DSHKM with its actual spade grip handles. So when we do some shooting with it, um, I will be controlling the elevation with one hand and controlling the gun and the trigger with the other hand. All right, so there is our elevation wheel. Uh, this lever on it is a locking lever. So if I hold that down, it locks my elevation. Uh, which is important because there is a tremendous amount of concussion and recoil that comes off of this behemoth when you shoot it. So, um, also worth pointing out, when you get this up to its, ex you know, some extreme elevation, uh, the spade grips actually interfere with the mounting block. That is part of why we have actually a release lever on uh, the original firing control here. So, to shoot this at high elevation, I would have to come way down inside the vehicle like this. Uh, which is not really conducive to using the spade grips. Um, while we're up here, you can see the feed block here. Um, I actually have a video on a semi-auto uh, DSHKM that shows this whole system pretty well. So I'll link to that um, at the end of this video. If you're more interested in more about the mechanism of this gun, uh, you can take a look at it there. In the meantime, though, uh, let's put some rounds through this. Воздух!
tell you, that muzzle brake gives you something, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. All right, so the PKT, the Dishka, these are pretty standard. They're cool. They're mm -hmm. very cool guns, but they're not particularly exotic when it comes to this sort of vehicle. No. What makes the T62 something unique and special is this main gun. Correct. So what, what's the deal? What is it? Well, you're basically trying to get as much punch as possible into his turret ring that, of that size. So there were a couple of different guns that were being developed at the time, the 100 millimeter rifles, uh, the T62A was a model that was designed to take a 100 millimeter rifle, not very many were built. Okay. But the problems that they had were the, although they've increased the size of the turret ring, the rounds are absolutely huge. And they weren't really pushing it. So the 100 millimeter round was 37 kilos, as I recall, for a single 100 millimeter round. That's chunky. Uh, and it, it was nearly 1.2 meters long. Whereas the round for the 115... I, there's not like 1.2 meters in that turret. No, there isn't. <laughs> the, the, that's part of the problem that we're dealing with here. So nope. the round for the 115 is 20 kilos and 1.1 meters long. So oh. you'll see inside, this is not going to be a small piece of ammunition. But again, they we're talking about rifling 100 and the Rapira anti-tank rifle, well, uh, correction, anti-tank gun, was already in service, the T12. And that was a 100 millimeter smooth bore. Okay. And they looked at the mathematics behind it and they saw just how much more penetration they were getting from the Rapira smooth bore than the rifled equivalent. So, so, okay, look, let's take the 100 millimeter rifled gun, let's bore out the rifling, and oh, it turns out to be about 115 millimeters. Okay, we'll get a little more bore diameter. And uh, well, you look at the case, it's like a neck down case. It's a massive amount of propellant in this thing. And the end result was that you had a muzzle velocity increase from about 1100 meters per second to nearly 1700 meters per second. 1700 meters per second? Mm -hmm. That is insane. Wow. And the gun work, this is one of those guns that because it was overtaken by the 125, it was never really developed to the extent that it probably could have been. Okay. Uh, but uh, if you look at the Iran-Iraq war, the, these things were punching through the front of chieftains, which were wow. the, the, the chieftain was the bogeyman for the Soviets at the time. So, oh, let's put our T-64s up against the chieftains. And uh, these things would go through uh, chieftains M60s. Uh, it was a very, very good gun. So the idea is you're getting rid of the rifling because you're actually using a sabode smaller projectile, right? Uh, for the fin stabilized round, yes. So th there's an interesting story behind this. So when the T-62 was first exported to Egypt, and, and the only reason it even got exported was it was supposed to be a secret tank, but one got captured by the Chinese during a border conflict and the secret was out. Oops. So they said, okay, well, we'll export it to everybody. So they exported it to Egypt. And the Egyptians got AP ammo, which was basically a solid slug with a few fins in the back, and HE ammo. Which again, it's just a big shell with a few fins at the back, but not same mode. Okay. But they forgot to change the optic for the gun. So the optic had reticles for AP, HE, and fin sabo. <laughs> and the Egyptians are going, hang on a second. What's you that said one? you said you said you sent us all the ammunition. And the Soviets are going, oh, uh, that was an administrative error. Don't worry, we'll send you the proper ammo. And that's what ended up being flung against the Israelis uh, you know, a year later. Uh, but uh, you, you could fire out of this round was AP, AP uh, fin stabo, uh, HE, uh, or heat. So a battle load for this would have been about 16 HE frag, 8 heat, high explosive anti tank chemical effect, and another 16 fin stabo. Okay. And this was like the first Soviet tank uh, with that sort of smoothbore gun. Mm -hmm. right? And they've kept with it ever since, and eventually NATO caught up. Okay, so at this, when this was introduced, NATO didn't have a no, smoothbore Na equivalent type gun. But NATO was barely introducing the 105, and when the Soviet leadership discovered that the, this brand new British 105 gun was going into service, and the best tank gun they had at the time was 100, that was part of the other reason that this got approved as 115. That's a smoothbore, because we can't have the NATO with a better, bigger gun than we have. We have to have a bigger gun. So that, this, that was another part of the reason T-62 got approved. This sounds like a, an issue of not necessarily a better gun, but a gun with a bigger number. That may have, well, for the politicians, there may be something to do with it. I mean, if you argue, is this a better gun than the British 105, you'll, you'll be arguing that till the cows come home. I and mean, the 105 is an absolutely fantastic, wonderful gun. This ain't bad. 
Okay, well, let's take a look inside and take a look at the actual shelves for it. Sure. All right. So if I remember correctly, there are four rounds of ammunition that are held ready in the turret. Yeah. So this. Oh. There's okay. really only two re really available. So this is not proper procedure for this. <laughs> but that's a chunky, heavy round. Uh, and you're going to somehow move it from there onto here and then slam it into the breech. And this is a side locking breech block. Now, the T62 also had a really cool auto ejection system, which uh, is not up and running on this particular vehicle yet. They're working on it, but it's not set up yet. What originally would have happened is after you fire, uh, the gun would come back to just, was it just above level, I believe? Two degrees up. Two degrees above level. Um, and it is going to open, automatically open this hatch in the back of the turret and eject the empty case just out the back of the turret because there is no space inside this thing for empty casings. Um, that, that will make this thing unusable very quickly. So it wasn't just for that also, it was also for the fumes. So we were talking mm. about the fumes in a PKT. Yeah. Well, another problem they had was the amount of fumes that were coming off this round were so horrible that they had to eject the rounds before they simply, over, uh, the oh, crew died, you know, not died, but became incapacitated due to the fumes. So that's, that's why I, the other thing, the other minor detail you may have noticed there, you see the ammunition is stowed around. It's like everywhere. Yeah, it is. And look at your feet. What rotates? Uh, I suspect there is no turret basket in this vehicle, is there? There isn't. There is a rotating floor. So where, you, where okay. your left foot is right now, well, both feet now, that will rotate. Okay. But still, if the turret rotates while you are trying to grab one of these rounds from anywhere except the two round, uh, the two round rack behind you there. Right. So these will rotate, but I've got a rack down here. And those, if the turret's moving, are just going to swing on past me. Mm -hmm. And more likely, I'm going to get one halfway out, and then the turret's going to jam on the round, and then it'll be just all sorts of horrible stuff. Right, which brings us to a problem with the D62 acquisition. So when you're reloading, and it's a long reload because these are big rounds, is uh, the gunner comes off target and has to stop tracking. So the gun, mm. the gun will depress, his sight is going to come off target because the gun is no longer aiming, and if the target was moving, he can't really track it anymore because otherwise the, the loader's going to have, have a Die. limb removed. Die, yeah. Basically. Yeah, that would add too. Yeah. And of course, we should point out, this is a recoiling gun carriage, so this whole thing is going to come ka-chunk back every time the gun fires. Well, shall we shoot it? I think that's a good idea. All right. Uh, we are not going to fire it from inside the turret for safety reasons. We are going to fire it electrically from outside, but we will have a camera in here so we can see exactly what happens. You ready? Send it. All right, let's do it. Concussion wave. Woo. No small amount of recoil coming back. Rock on that. And you definitely hit the hillside. Yes, sir. <laughs> well, that's pretty cool. Never shot a 115 before, I'll tell you that. I don't think anybody has in the US, actually. <laughs> uh, actually, I think this was only the third live round ever fired from this tank in, in private hands. <laughs> nice. That's really cool. Uh, nice bit of concussion from that thing. No, well, honestly, I, I, I not as bad. I rock back, though. Yeah, but the, the concussion was not as bad as I was expecting. Um, I think I'm 
used to as much as one gets used to it, uh, like anti-tank guns with muzzle brakes. Mm. And this does not need or have a muzzle brake. So, in fact, with a saber round, it can also also be a trouble. You do not want that; it will explode on you. Yeah, so there, there is actually a way of fitting a saber <laughs> round onto a, onto a muzzle brake, like Firefly showed on the 17 pounder, but it is mm. very, very tricky. Okay. At any rate, um, I'd like to give a really big thanks to Battlefield Vegas for giving us access to this tank. Thanks to you, Nick, for coming out and uh, helping show me around this thing, because this is certainly your bailiwick. Awesome tank, uh, though. Anybody who is interested in this sort of fantastic heavy equipment, definitely check out your channel uh, for all sorts of stuff. And naturally, thanks to Wargaming for effectively sponsoring the video. Um, check out World of Tanks if you like it, and if a bunch of people uh, decide to start playing and keep playing it, then We're perhaps do this again. Wargaming will let us come do another tank. I'm kind of curious what the next, like, this was a really cool step up from the Sherman. I don't know what the next step up from a T-62. I, I can think of two. Uh, I'm not quite sure which of the two. Actually, I can think of three at least. You and I go to the tank biathlon? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we'll, we'll, be, have a, we'll have our own entry. Tra yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just like you keep using these old, uh, old guns in your two gun. We, we show up in a T sixty two or something really old. I was gonna say an FT seventeen, but okay. That could take us a while to get around the course. Yeah, yeah. Be fun though. It'll be, it'll be night by the time we finish. Get, get run over by a T sixty two. Anyway, uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Uh, thanks to everyone who made it possible, and uh, we'll see you uh, tomorrow.